this afternoon's Mass offered for the repose of the souls of George Hackett Jr., Anne Marie Ayano, and Mary Burton. The first reading is a reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. On that day, a shoot shall sprout from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a bud shall blossom. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and of understanding, a spirit of counsel and of strength a spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be the fear of the Lord. Not by appearance shall he judge, nor by heresy shall he decide. But he shall judge the poor with justice and decide a right for the lands afflicted. He shall strike the ruthless with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Justice shall be the band around his waist, and faithfulness a belt upon his hips. Then the wolf shall be a guest of the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the king. The calf and the young lion shall browse together, with a little child to guide them. The cow and the bear shall be neighbors, Together their young shall rest. The lion shall eat hay like the ox. The baby shall play by the cobra's den. And the child lay his hand on the adder's lair. There shall be no harm or ruin on all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be filled with knowledge of the Lord. As water covers the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse, set up as a signal for the nations, the Gentiles shall seek out, for his dwelling shall be glorious. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The response for us is, justice shall flourish in his time, and fullness of peace forever. Justice shall flourish in his time and fullness of peace forever. O oh God, with your judgment endow the king, and with your justice the king's son. You shall govern your people with justice, and your afflicted ones with judgment. Justice shall flourish in his time, and fullness of peace forever. Justice shall flower in his days, and profound peace till the moon be no more. May he rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Justice shall flourish in his time and fullness of peace forever. For he shall rescue the poor when he cries out and the afflicted when he has no one to help him. 
He shall have pity for the lowly and the poor. The lives of the poor he shall save. Justice shall flourish in his time and hold his peace forever. May his name be blessed forever. As long as the sun, his name shall remain. In him shall all the tribes of the earth be blessed. All the nations shall proclaim his happiness. Justice shall flourish in his time and fullness of peace forever. The second reading is a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the, to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, whatever was previously written was written for our instruction that by endurance and by the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to think in harmony with one another, in keeping with Christ Jesus, that with one accord, you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, then, as Christ welcomed you, for the glory of God. For I say that Christ became a minister of the circumcised to show God's truthfulness, to confirm the promises to the patriarchs, but so that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his paths. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. Alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you. John the Baptist appears preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was of him that the prophet Isaiah had spoken when he said, a voice of one crying out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. At that time, Jerusalem, all Judea, and the whole region around the Jordan were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the coming realm? Produce good fruit as evidence of your repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now, the ax lies at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I am baptizing you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise you, Lord Jesus In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Last week, I spoke to you about Isaiah the prophet. Remember prophets in the Old Testament before Christ came, that first part of the Bible. God did not speak directly to the people. He spoke through prophets. And we saw last week that Isaiah the prophet, who came maybe 700 years before our Lord's birth, Isaiah, of all the prophets, had the most to say about the coming of the Savior, pointing out different things that should be looked for that would identify Christ when he came into the world. Today's Gospel talks about the last of the Old Testament prophets. And the very last person that God chose to tell the world his son was coming. As a matter of fact, this last prophet, St. John the Baptist, his message was not God is coming into the world. John the Baptist's message was he's here. He's already come. You have to go out to meet him and recognize him. One of the signs that Isaiah said that when the last prophet comes, pointing to the coming of the Messiah, <coughs> he would go out into the desert and he would cry out in the empty, deserted place that God had arrived. John the Baptist did that. He lived in deserted places, rarely ever went to Jerusalem. And when he preached, he preached in a deserted place by the River Jordan. First of all, John the Baptist, as you heard in today's Gospel, by the way he dressed, by what he ate, he was a strange man. If you saw John the Baptist on the subway, you'd move to another car. You'd want to get away from this guy. He was a very strange man. He dressed strange. He acted strange. He had a strange background. His mother was somehow related to the Blessed Mother. It says they were kinswomen, which could mean cousins, could mean a lot of things. They were related in some way. Her and her husband were past the age of having children, and they never had children, and they prayed to have a child. And her and her husband made a promise to God. If you give us a child, after five years, we will give you the child back. It was a very strange promise to make. God blessed them with the child, John the Baptist. When he was about five years old, they took him to what I can best describe as a Jewish monastery, where the scribes sat and copied the scriptures by hand all day long and studied the scriptures. He's five years old. They take him to the monastery and they leave him with the Jewish monks. You think to yourself, wow, the poor kid, no mother, no father, the rest of the time, copying the scriptures. No wonder he was a little strange. But God used his strangeness. So John the Baptist is in the wilderness. It's a deserted area by the Jordan River. When you go over the Gotham's Bridge into New Jersey, you see these marsh lands. No one lives there, there are no houses. It's all bogs and marsh. That's what it is by the Jordan River where John the Baptist was. John the Baptist gave the message that he had been told by God. The Messiah has come. If you want to go out to meet him. First, you have to be sorry for your sins. And you have to have 
the baptism which washes away your sins. Then you must believe in what the Messiah, what the Christ will tell you and change your life. He's not going to come and say, oh, you're a good guy. Just continue as you're going. Uh, you don't have to change. You're fine just the way you are. That's not what the Messiah is saying. He's saying, you've got to change. You, there are things about you that you have to change. And I will show you what the sins are. I will show you what it is you have to change. If you're coming to the Messiah, if you're going to accept the Christ, if you're going to accept baptism, this is what you have to do. John the Baptist never took his message to the city. If he had gone to Jerusalem, we know that every day thousands of people were coming and going in the temple. There were people who came to pray. They would have listened to John the Baptist. If he had gone to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, these were the leaders of the Jewish community. If he had gone to them and won them over, they could have brought a lot of people with them to believe in the message of the Baptist and believe in the Christ who had already come into the world. But he never went to Jerusalem. He stayed in that marsh country, maybe two days walk from Jerusalem. But it says, St. Matthew tells us, people were going out to him. Crowds of people were going out to him. Hold on to that, because in that seemingly throwaway description, is the key to today's gospel. They were going out to him. They were inconveniencing themselves to go out and find God. And that becomes the identifying mark of faith. We inconvenience ourselves to find God. We don't find God on the TV set. That's too convenient. And the things that are too convenient, we don't value. If you hand me something, I give it one value. If I had to earn it, it has another value in my life. The things that we earn, that we work for, we will always value more. So inconveniencing ourselves to get out of the warmth of our lazy boy sofa and get up and out and go find God will be a mark of real faith. And when these people were inconveniencing themselves, you know, we have to imagine, all right, so we're gonna go to the country. Uh, we're gonna take a ride to Pennsylvania, we're gonna go upstate New York, we're gonna to go to the, the wilderness to look at the trees. For us, it's really not that inconvenient. So you're going to find gas stations, rest stops. You're going to find restaurants, you're going to find gift shops. You're gonna find all sorts of things along the way. It's not a terrible journey for us. And so we're going to say, well, maybe I'm, I'm not going to find those things. I'll pack my lunch. So how do you pack your lunch? You take your peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You put it in saran wrap. It stays absolutely fresh. You take a thermos lined with glass that will keep your drink hot or cold as you wish. It's no great problem. In our Lord's time, there were no places to stop along the way. There, there were no 7-Elevens or rest stops. There was no, you were going out and whatever food you had was what you carried. So you took your peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you wrapped it in a piece of cloth. And you took that piece of cloth 
with your sandwich wrapped in it, and you put it in a leather pouch. And don't think that the smell and taste of the leather didn't seep through the cloth onto your peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And whatever you brought to drink, you carried in a leather flask. And don't think that water tasted good after it was in a leather flask in the sun as you walked along. So, all right, you had some food to eat, but you didn't really want to eat it unless you absolutely had to, unless you were starting to get a headache because you hadn't eaten. You might take a bite of that sandwich, which wouldn't taste that good. When it says they went out to hear the Baptist's message, it meant they really inconvenienced themselves. Who went? Mostly simple people. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, those who were considered the religious, they had everything under control. They had invented a system for themselves that satisfied them, and they didn't really want to hear anything else. They didn't think they needed this. It was mostly people like the apostles, fishermen and farmers, craftsmen, small business people, day laborers on someone else's vineyard. These are the people who they wouldn't have been the great intelligent people by the standards of the world, but they were dumb enough to know they needed God. They went out and inconvenienced themselves. And they stood on line, waiting for John the Baptist to baptize them. And when they came up to him, he would say, are you truly sorry for your sins? Do you want your sins forgiven and washed away? Yes, they would tell him. Do you understand you have to believe in what our Lord teaches and follow what he teaches? Yes. Do you understand you have to change your life? You can't come here and expect that after you go away, you're going to be the same person that you were before. You are here to learn what needs to be changed so that you could be the person God needs you to be rather than the person you think you want to be. And when they said yes, he baptized them. But then the gospel tells us, John the Baptist, strange man, did something that was totally anti-marketing, anti-salesmanship. There were some Pharisees and Sadducees who did come out, probably just out of curiosity. And they got online to be baptized. And when he saw them online, he chased them away. That's not good marketing skills, guy. You're not going to sell your product by chasing people away. I don't want him at White Elephant across the street. <laughs> he chased the people away. You, he would say, you brood of vipers, you snakes, get off the line. I'm not going to baptize you. You know who did this? Maybe about 40 years ago, it was still being done. You know who Padre Pio is, St. Pio? When people would come on pilgrimages to the monastery where he was, he would hear confessions for like 15 and 20 hours straight because everyone wanted to confess to the saint. They wanted to hear his spiritual advice. So they would line up all day long waiting to go to confession to Padre Pio. Every once in a while, Padre Pio had to do what every priest does. You gotta get out of there and stretch, sitting in that box. He would get out to stretch, look at the people on the line, and tell some of the people on the line, in front of everyone, just the way John the Baptist did. 
get off the line, he would say. You're not sorry for your sins. You don't intend to change. You think I'm going to do some magic to change your life. I can't do that. Be sorry for your sins. Do what our Lord tells you. Change your life, and then you'll find happiness. Until you're ready to do that, get off the line. I'm not going to hear your confession. He would do that. Why? Well, they all wanted to confess to the saint, but the saint read hearts. God had given Padre Pio the power to read hearts. He knew what they were thinking. John the Baptist apparently knew what these Pharisees and scribes were thinking. And he told them to get off the line, call them a brood of vipers. Get off the line. There's a lot of drama, a lot of symbolism surrounding John the Baptist, the strangeness of the person, the place, and the message. But it all comes together as we prepare for Christmas with the point, think, sorrow for sin, accepting what Christ teaches and following it, and changing our lives is not something that's part of the world. It's God's world, not this world. To have faith is to be totally counterculture. We don't impress the rich and the famous of the world. Every once in a while, someone rich and famous may for a little bit dabble in the things of faith, but they're not going to change their lives. They're not going to follow the commandments that Christ gave. They may be interested in the things for a little while, but they would be people that St. John the Baptist would have said, no, get off the line. You're not really here to greet God as he comes into the world. Get ready and then come back on the line. Faith is not something that is convenient or acceptable to the world we live in. To believe and keep the commandments is as strange to people of the world as John the Baptist was to the people of the world. The gospel kind of reminds us we have an identity as Catholics. Uh, it's not necessarily pleasing to the world, nor should it be, nor do I need it to be, nor should we try to accommodate the world that we live in, nor should we try to make it acceptable. God's word, God's truth is presented. It's there to be reached for. In reaching for it, there is inconvenience. Yes, also, there has to be what John the Baptist preached. God is coming into the world. He's come. If you want to go out to meet him, be sorry for your sins. Wash them away in the sacrament. Understand that you now have to follow him and do what he says. You can't go back to business as usual. And change yourself into the person God needs you to be. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please stand for the creed, I believe.
Blessed be the kingdom of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, now forever, for ages unto endless ages. Amen. The response to each petition will be, Lord, have mercy. To our Holy Father, Pope Francis, our bishops, priests, religious, and all the faithful servants of God, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. And our president, may be God-fearing, our elected officials, blessed with wisdom, and that God will watch over and protect our service, men and women, throughout the world. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the for the peace of the whole world, for the peace and well-being of a holy Roman Catholic Church, and the union of all churches, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, <clears throat> For those suffering from the devastating effects of natural disasters, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, mercy. For the sick of our parish, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, mercy. For deceased family and friends, especially Raymond W. McNaughton Jr., and all the souls enrolled in our parish purgatorial society for this month, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. O God, help, save, pity, protect us who call upon you in faith. For we do rely on the intercession of Blessed Virgin Mary, imploring St. Gennaro, St. John the Baptist, all the saints, we commend ourselves, each other, our whole lives to Christ our God, to thee be glory for ages unto endless ages. Amen. Thursday, December 8th, is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, a holy day of obligation with the same obligation as Sunday. Please consult the bulletin for our schedule of Masses. of your mercy. For we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just. Our duty, our salvation. Always and everywhere, 
to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For he assumed at his coming the lowliness of human flesh, and so fulfilled the design you formed long ago, and opened for us the way to eternal salvation, that when he comes again in glory and majesty, and all is at last made manifest, we who watch for the day may inherit the great promise in which now we dare to hope. So with angels, archangels, thrones, dominions, the hosts, the powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory. Without end, we acclaim. Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread. Giving thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more, giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, <coughs> saying, Take this, all of you, drink from it. This is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Lord, 
bread of life, chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray, partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world. Bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, John, our Bishop, all the clergy. Remember, brothers and sisters, fallen asleep in hope of resurrection, all who died in your mercy, welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Blessed Joseph, her spouse, Blessed Apostles, the saints who pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him, God, Almighty Father, in unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory, all honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin, safe from all distress, as we await blessed hope, the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you, Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. Graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, O body of Christ, keep me safe for eternal life.